Hey booktube, it's Jackie. How's it going? If you are new to me and this is the first time you're seeing my face, hello, what's up? My name's Jackie. I sit on my floor and I talk about books. So I hope that's why you're here because that's what's going to be happening today. If you are not new to me, thank you for always tuning in the continued support. I really do appreciate it. As you can see from the day's title of the video, I have a book review for you today and it is on Nick Jameson's Holier Than Thou, The Star People, The Witch, and The Forest King. And just for a little precursor, I will be referring to the entirety of the video, this book, as Holier Than Thou because that is a mouthful of a title. Okay, just a heads up. Um, this is an advanced reader copy that I received through Reezy Discovery. If you are not familiar with Reezy Discovery, it's a company that reached out to me a few months ago and asked me to be a video reviewer for them. And this is my second go around with them. This is the second book I've chosen. And I am very excited and very privileged to talk about this book because this one was not what I expected. So with that being said, and without further ado, please grab yourself a drink, have yourself a seat, and let's get talking about Nick Jameson's Holier Than Thou. All right, so as I previously stated, this is by Nick Jameson, and its release date is October 6, 2022. So if you're seeing this prior to that date, you will have to wait till that date for be able to purchase. But if you're seeing it afterwards and you feel so inclined to go pick it up, you are more than welcome to. And I found it through Reedsy Discovery. So a little bit of stats about this book. Um, I would consider this book philosophical fiction as a genre. And if you are not familiar with that genre, philosophical fiction are stories devoted to discussion and discursive philosophy, such as, but not limited to, the function and role of society, the purpose of life, ethics, morals, the role of art in human lives, the role of experience, and the development of knowledge. I also slightly categorize this as spiritual fiction because of some of the themes that are portrayed in this book. And spiritual fiction is spirituality rather than mental ability drives the plot. I feel like there is a lot of spirituality in this book that is helping drive the plot. So I would consider that, but that's my own personal opinion. There is also graphic sexual content as a trigger. There is an age gap and there is murder. So you have been warned about the triggers involved in this book. Now, why did I pick this book? I'll tell you why. Because when I was looking for a book, I caught this cover caught my eye and I thought it was interesting. So I clicked on it. And as a reviewer for Reads Discovery, I can get a preview of um, the first couple pages of the book. And the first couple pages of the book, I saw the dedication. This is the dedication to Nick Jameson's book. And I'm going to read it right here. Dedicated to the 2022 employee roster of a certain bookstore in Bend, Oregon, those compromising the emotional heart of this book were not only did deceit and prejudicial collusion lead to my psychologically traumatic wrongful termination, but were misled management therefore reneged on its verbal contract to sell my books. This novella represents the turning of treachery into triumph. Oh, and by the way, if you truly do reap what we sow, some of you may want to stay out of your fields for a while. I read that and thought immediately, I have to read this book because any author who has the balls enough to put that as their dedication, I want to read it. I want to know what you're talking about. I want to know if you can back it up. I want to know. I'm down. Let's go for it. So maybe it was, I want to see if you're actually that cool of a badass or if you're just talking out your ass. And that's what drew me to this book. And then I read the summary. And I'm going to read directly the summary that I was provided. This is written by the author. And the only thing I actually, no, I have not changed anything in this. I have not taken anything out. This is directly what I was given as a summary to this book. Alex is the black sheep in the Barnes clan, a Christian community concealed in the Blue Ridge Mountains near Salem, Virginia, dedicated to a simple, righteous life. He was born an outsider, reads the wrong things, wants, the right, wants to write about non-religious spirituality, thinks, like the pagans, that nature is divine and, worst of all, is too old to be flirting with the young women of the community. One such woman, Libby, who has eyes for Alex, controls the community through her father, the shepherd of the Barnes clan flock, Father Andrew. Alex suspects Libby may not just be the master of deception, but also a practitioner of the dark arts, placing Alex in a great peril for he's fallen in love with Libby's best friend, Miranda. B. 
Being in love, Alex can't bring himself to flee from the peril closing in all around him. Seeking refuge in the surrounding forest, he uncovers a mystical sanctuary, possessing mysterious powers connected to old legends, to a deity called the Forest King, and to a Native American tribe, the Star People, rumored to have once tapped into nature's power like no people before or since, yet who are now feared and have gone extinct. Uh, that sounds fucking amazing. I was tingling when I read that. I was signing me up. Not only do I have a ballsy dedication, but then I've got this really cool, badass, sort of outsider, village sort of thing going on here with some thriller elements and some romance. I was like, this has Jackie written all the fuck over it. Yes, 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 yes. That's the summary I was given. That is not the story I got. <laughs> oh yeah, all of that happens. All of that happens. But this book, this book is not about that story. The real story is what's between the lines of that. And I was shocked. I was floored. And I felt kind of dumb for most of the book. But then I reread it for the second time, not through the eyes of somebody looking for this story, but through my background. I have a bachelor's degree in history with a double minor in philosophy and gender women's studies. So I started putting my phil philosophical hat back on and I'll be damned if I didn't find a kick-ass story written between the lines of this story. So, what worked in this book? What worked in this book? The original plot. The base story of this is a great fucking idea. I was sold off of just the summary. I was ready. I was geared for it. I was bringing it on. I loved it. I would have loved to see the original plot more fleshed out, learned more about the village and the community that the Barnes clan had created, learned why Alex was really an outsider, gotten more and more. This is a novella length. I would have loved to have this as a full length novel if it was just the story element, okay? If we're just talking based on just the story, that summary I read you, I wanted more of that. That plot was fucking brilliant and I loved it. Very reminiscent of the M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Village. Um, very reminiscent of it without the, uh, creepy pig people. Sorry, without the creepy pig people. We have a, we have an elk king, which is even cooler. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was great. But yes, I, the original plot was fantastic and I loved it. But like I said, this story is not just that. That is a lens to look through. The real story are the themes that Jameson brings to the forefront in this book, which follow such as getting back to nature. Very, very heavy on leaving societal constraints, the societal norms, and getting back to our base human person. Being one with nature, its medicinal values, its healing properties, it's just, it's tranquility, it's it's peace, getting back to it. And it is heavenly laden through this book. I mean, the Barnes clan left society and regressed back. I'm not quite for sure exactly how far they regressed back because he doesn't go into quite that much detail. He does reference that it's similar to The Village. It would be the inspiration for the film The Village. He actually says that in the book. So I'm thinking not puritanical times, but maybe somewhere in between because some of the uh, young ladies partake in um, some modern day artistic choices of body modification. So um, not completely regressed back, but still enough where there is a definite divide between society and this community that the clan, the Barnes clan has formed. Um, another theme that is heavenly brought to the forefront is a, uh, and this just made me smile. Okay. So my, my theory, my area of 
philosophy is ethics. That's where um, I did my emphasis with. And he brought up the herd mentality. I was just Frederick Nietzsche. I think I'm saying is right. I've heard it Nietzsche and Nietzsche. I pronounce it Nietzsche. So if I, if I pronounce it wrong, I apologize. Just how I've always been trying to say it. Um, the herd mentality versus, versus individual thought and the true pursuit of knowledge. Oh my God. When the scene happens with the mob, <sighs> college Jackie was in love was just in love with this idea. I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm seeing it all over again. I feel like I'm back in philosophy class and just delving in and digging and digging. It was just fantastic. I just reveled in it. I reveled in it and I loved it. Frederick Nietzsche, Nietzsche was one of my favorite philosophers to study because of this herd mentality and Ubermosch concept. I just freaking adored it. It was fantastic. I loved it. Thank you so much for bringing that out because that is still something in today's society that is very, very rampant. I mean, we just went through COVID 2020 where the herd mentality was clearly on display all over the damn place. So I just thought it was brilliant. And the way it was displayed was very, very easy to understand, to get it through. So even if you don't have a philosophy background, you are still seeing the herd mentality that we've heard about. Um, and if you are not familiar with that, that is where in the whole like group agrees based off of emotions instead of actual facts. Um, it's also known as mob mentality. And it was just, it was superbly done. It was very, very well done. I had a great time with that. I just, oh, it made me so excited. <laughs> it made me so excited. Um, and another thing that was brought to the forefront that I was really, really shocked about was the concept of misandry. If you are not familiar with misandry, that is the male version of misogyny. Misandry is the hatred and prejudice against men, while misogyny is the hatred and pre prejudice against women. And Alex experiences this, not to the extent that I think warrants it really being called misandry. So I want to make that clear. Um, but there's clear times where instances between him and a young woman, they only listen to the female, but we know as the reader that it was the male that was actually being sexually harassed, but they won't listen to him because A, he was not the first one to tell his story and B, he's a male. So they're going to believe a 17 year old female over a 30 year old male. And it's, it was really unique to see that brought to the forefront because it's, it's something that does happen. It is existence. It is, it exists in our world today. And a lot of people don't recognize it when it happens because they just think, oh, you're a guy, suck it up. Like, really? No, they, they can be taken for granted too. And their voices deserve to be heard just as much as our, as we do. You want equality? It goes both ways. And I just love that it was brought to the forefront that way. And it was just the way it was displayed. Um, it was not to the degree where I think it is prejudice and extreme hatred, but it is a, an assumption that the male is wrong in this story versus the female, even though we as the reader know. So I, I do want to make that clear that it's brought to the forefront, but not to the degree where I think prejudice would be the word to describe it. More of um, the assumption and lack of um, wanting to listen, lack of wanting to even believe a male in this community. Another thing that really worked in this book is there's an instance where we learn about some of the folklore of the star people and then we see it repeat itself and so the concept that history repeats itself if you don't learn what happened in the past the same things are going to happen except in this instance even if you do learn about what happened in the past history can still repeat itself because we are emotional beings and there are times where our feelings speak louder than our thoughts and drive us more. And that was definitely shown 
in this book through Alex and Miranda's relationship, especially Alex's side. Um, it, I thought it was brilliant that he brought that up, that he showed that history is repeating itself. Cause you see, as the reader, you see it happening. You do, you're like, this is, dude, don't go back. Don't, don't go back. I was saying it I'm like, don't go back. But you did because his emotions and his feelings for Miranda were so much stronger and louder than his own thoughts. So I thought that was great. I thought it was fantastic. Um, another element that I really liked in this was Alex is a writer. He writes all different kinds of things. And one of the things he writes is poetry. And we do get two poems in this book. And I want to read one of them to you because it's, it's a really nice poem. It's really, really nice. Um, let me see if I can find it really quickly. It was marked and then my post-it note disappeared. So let me just bring it up. So I know Alex is writing this, but obviously Nick Jameson wrote it. So you can tell that Nick Jameson is definitely a poet at heart. He he has the logical brain of a, phil of a philosopher, but the heart of a poet. So how he gives that same characteristics to Alex, I thought was brilliant. And here's one of the poems. It's called Urges. Every time I'm next to you, I have the urge to wrap my arm around your waist. Every time I can see you, I have the urge to close all the distance between us. Every time I smell you, I have the urge to drop my face into your neck and inhale. Every time you touch me, I have the urge to grab and embrace you completely. Every time you smile at me, I have the urge to pull you in and kiss you deeply. Every time you laugh with someone else, I have the urge to scare them away. Every time you write to me, I have the urge to describe love with every word. Every day without you, I have the urge to come to you and show you why it's wrong. Every little lack of you, I have the urge to demonstrate what completeness contains. Okay, so I thought that was really romantic and it was very, very sweet. And if a guy wrote me that poem, I would love it. I would love it. 19 year old me and he's writing this about Miranda who's 19 would have adored that poem okay I would have adored that I've been like oh, swoon swoon I would have swooned okay I would have I thought it was really sweet and I'm really glad that these little touches of romance were thrown into this book because it made Alex seem more relatable of a character to me it made him It just made him real. It made him, it showed who he was other than just his intellect. And intellect is sexy. Do not get me wrong. Intellect is very, very sexy, but it's also nice when you can use that intellect in a very emotional, romantic way. And then you have all, all the spectrum there. So I was really appreciative of the poems in this book. I thought they were brilliant. I thought they were moving. And I very much appreciate him. So thank you for those. That was a nice bone to be thrown to me. I loved it. However, as much as I think all of these things worked in this book, there were some things in this book that I think didn't work. And these are strictly my opinions. I am not paid for these. These are just my opinions. And um, so please don't come for me. <laughs> um, the style of writing. Nick Jameson obviously is extremely talented and extremely well versed. I mean, that poem is stunning. And there are many, many prose in this book that are very moving and very poignant and just worded so exquisitely done. I loved it. I loved it. But for a lot of this book, I felt like I was reading action sequences of a script. If you give me a script, I was reading the italicized parts. Alex does this. Alex then does this. Alex thought this. Almost as if they're instructions for actors playing a role. And I know based off of different elements of this book that this man can write better than that. So to have that in there, it kind of threw me. It did. I, I didn't quite understand what was going on with that. Um, and it kind of bothered me a little bit, but because I saw the beauty in his writing, 
I, I saw some of the, the prose that he used when he described the sanctuary. I was just like, I have this, but then you have this. I don't understand how these are coming from the same person. So I don't know how long it took him to write this book. I don't know where he was in his life when he wrote por portions of this book. So I think maybe that has something to do with it. Or the fact that the guy's so freaking smart that he just needed a break and just write the action sequences down and be done with it and moving on to get through his real themes of the story. Um, so we do have a sex scene in this book. Um, so we do have a little bit of romance, super sexy fun time. Um, I was not a fan of it and I love the super sexy fun times. I love open door. I love graphic language. I love all of it. I was not a fan of this scene. It felt very forced. It felt very forced. And the reason why it felt forced is because Miranda is reciting a letter that Alex wrote to her. And that's the forced part. It, it sounds, for lack of a better word, like he was sexting, but in letter format. And it just felt very, very stiff. It felt very non-romantic, and I know that he has romance in him because I've seen the poems. Now, mind you, this is the letter that he is right that he has written to Miranda that she's reciting to him as she is kind of seducing him. After the letter is repeated, then we actually have the intimate scene, and that scene is very fluid, very easy, very it's there. It's It's not a fade to black, but it's not a straight graphic scene either. The letter is graphic. The actual sex scene is kind of like an in-between, like maybe the door's kind of cracked open and I'm kind of like looking in a little bit. I'm not seeing all of it. I have to use my imagination for a little bit. So that's why I say that the sex scene seems very forced because the actual sex description, the graphic language, that felt very forced. It didn't feel natural to me, um, but the actual intimate scene itself did. So another juxtaposition in the writing styles. Um, so that, that, that wasn't a fun time for me. Um, it was still entertaining and I still was able to graphically picture it. So there's that. But um, it just, it wasn't as fluid as some of the rest of the areas of the book. Um, something that started to grate on me, um, Alex, the feeling I get from Alex most of the time is paranoid. He's so worried that any little thing he does, because he's an outsider, is going to be judged wrongly. We know that he doesn't write what the clan approves of. We know that the clan doesn't approve of him flirting with a 19-year-old and he's in his 30s. So he has this overarching dark cloud of paranoia all the time and it goes away for a little bit at the end but then it comes back and that kind of bothered me I just I felt like the character of Alex that was being created wouldn't give a shit he wouldn't care based off the things that he was writing and the ideas that he held I just feel like he wouldn't give a shit what other people thought but then again, this is his home. This is where he was raised and born. And so you do have that factoring in and that fear. So maybe it was just too much paranoia for me, but it had to be there for his character development. It just seemed like there was a lot of it, a lot, like overarching, like he was some kind of victim, but nothing actually happened. He was so worried that he was gonna be a victim and then a self-fulfilling prophecy happened. And I was just like, no, you didn't do the self-fulfilling prophecy thing. Yeah. All of that paranoia came back for the big climax. And I'm like, oh, damn it. No, I did not want that for him. I did not want that. But it did progress the plot along and progress the story to get the ending that we got. 
I totally understood it, but I did not personally want it. I did not want that self-fulfilling prophecy. I did not want that paranoia and that fear to actually be seen and happen. So that was just irritating for me a little bit. And this next item, um, this is strictly because I think people would get annoyed by this. I personally thought it was hilarious and I had a good time with this, but I could see people being really annoyed by this. Nick Jameson is very intelligent and he is not afraid to show it. People might read this book and even think he's slightly pretentious. And why? Because he uses a lot of multi-syllabic words. I cannot say that word, so a lot of big ass words, okay? A lot of multi-syllable words with high point values in Scrabble that I definitely, while reading this, had to break out my dictionary to remind myself what half these words fucking meant. <laughs> I thought it was humorous. I was like, you know what? All right, you got me, dude, you got me. All right, great, that's fine, cool. Um, but other people, I could feel thinking you're a little pretentious um, for the words that you were using, especially seeing the summary that I read in the beginning. That's the summary that I was provided. So I was not expecting a vocabulary lesson. I was not expecting it all. I personally thought it was funny because jokes on me for not being prepared and not knowing those big words. And I will not forget some of them because they were used quite a bit. And <laughs> I had to put my thinking cap on for this book. Definitely, for sure. I had to. It was good. It felt good to stretch those muscles, those brain muscles I haven't used in a long time. So I do appreciate it. But I could definitely see somebody reading this summary thinking they're going to get this cool thriller, um, regression, societal book and then be like, this is a walking freaking thesaurus. Why am I reading this? Also... The idea that you could be held very pretentious. Being pretentious is, if you're not familiar with that word, um, the definition is loosely saying things to make yourself sound more impressive when you really aren't. And I don't think this author had to do this. I think he's impressive. He didn't need to impress me with big words. His philosophical points are clear as day in this book. They are, and I didn't need the big words to be impressed. I was already impressed. So I, I felt kind of bad for that because I could definitely see a lot of readers thinking, God, this guy's a dick. But I didn't think that, and I didn't think he needed to do that, come across that way. Um, I really enjoyed this book. I didn't in the beginning, but once I started think reading it through a philosophical lens, I fucking loved this. I thought it was great, um, but you have to read it through a certain type of lens. And if you're not prepared for that, you're going to see pretentious, you're going to see wordy, you're going to see a very basic bone story without a lot of description. But if you look through it through the right lens, you're going to see a beautiful display of themes and, ide and ideologies that are held by a lot of people that are scared to say them because they are outside the grid, they're off the grid kind of ideas. They're, they're not, they're not societally accepted all the time. So yeah, the fact that you have to read through a specific lens is definitely something that, um, doesn't lend to the beauty of this book, unless you know it going in and you are prepared to read it through that lens. Now, since there was a sex scene, this does get a spice rating. And I gave it a 2.5 on the chili pepper scale. There was some minor graphic language, uh, especially in that letter. And the there is brief descriptions of oral and sexual activities. And it's outdoors. So we get a special location. Yes, I always like different locations. I, I don't like it always being in a bed. I, I, I enjoy the surrounding area and the environment, especially with the description he gave of the area he was in, it sounded beautiful and it sounded romantic and it sounded soothing and it sounded special and unique, which was perfect for that moment. My final thoughts. If you love philosophy, I think you'll enjoy this book. I think you will enjoy it because you will know the lens to read it through. And he actually says that. So let me read you the quote. 
and this is directly from his book, those works requiring more of the reader than most are willing to expend in order to fathom the fuller, more beautiful, entirely interconnected picture of existence. You need to read between the lines to, under, to really enjoy the story. You have to read through that different lens. You have to put the work in. You have to take the time and break down the paragraphs because these things are dense. They're wordy. There's big words, but if you can break them down and you want to actually take the time to do that, you're going to see a beautiful story. You will, but it takes work. And if there's anything that highly educated people know, good things come with effort and work. And it's clearly displayed in this. And then there's another quote in here that I want to read that helps summarize some of my final thoughts. The act of reading to be an inseparable part of creating meaning. That meaning doesn't belong to the writer, his or herself, but it's an exchange between writer and reader as if they're having a conversation and therefore every translation will be different and will reflect the dynamic that exists between them. When I read that quote, it reminded me of my very first philosophy class, my very first one. I walked in to my philosophy 101 class, sat down, and the word reality was written on the chalkboard. And my professor looked at me, called me out, never met the man before in my life, and said, define reality. What? Define reality? So I sat. So I sat there and I thought about it and I happened to look over to my left and there was a gorgeous, gorgeous young man sitting next to me. This man had a jawline that could cut glass. Okay. Wavy hair, dark, dark eyes. And he winked at me. He winked at me. And so I blushed. And then I thought, is he winking at me because he thinks I'm cute? Or is that a wink of encouragement to say what I really wanted to say because it's written on my face. So I went with the latter and I said, perception. And my philosophy instructor stopped and looked at me and said, can you explain that? It's just a single word. And I said, perception is one's reality. What I perceive to be the truth is the truth. What you perceive to be the truth is your truth. If I want to change your truth, I have to change your perception and vice versa. Reality is your truth. So perception is your reality. And he looked at me and said, good answer. And then went to the next person. And I looked over to the young man sitting next to me and he just did silently this. And I knew in that first day that I found something really special, that I knew philosophy was gonna be something important to me. I don't think I was gonna major in it, so I minored in it, but it was gonna be important. And when I read that quote, it brought me back to that moment. And it reminded me of that moment. And that moment was a turning point in my life. I started looking at things differently, reading things differently, and realizing that I don't have to fit into the mold. I have my own brain, I have my own thoughts. And if I read something and I perceive this in the story, this is what I see from the story, this is what the story is telling me, that's what I got because that's the truth. The truth is, if you read this book, it's gonna say something completely different to you. Yes, you will get the bare bones story of Alex, the writer, Miranda. You'll get that love story. You'll get the going and finding the mythical area. You'll get 
all of the drama that is involved in the base story, but the real story, the story between the lines. You're not going to get the same story I got. You're going to get your own. That's completely directly affected based off of the time frame you're reading it, the mental state you're reading it, your background, your heritage, what, everything that makes you up is going to affect this story. Because the themes that are brought to the forefront are themes of humanity. And your humanity is affected by what you deal with every single day. And I just, I love that. So I actually can't rate this book. For me, I give this book a four for me. But for you, it could be something completely different. That's my review of Nick Jameson's Holier Than Thou. And Mr. Jameson, if you ever see this, thank you for letting me read your book. Thank you for sharing it with me. I felt like I was back in college and reminded me, it reminded me so much of something I fell in love with. And I might have forgotten a little bit of it. And <laughs> you schooled me some. I appreciate it. Um, I think you have a special piece here. Is it going to be for everybody? Hell no. Hell no. But for those people out there that want to give it a shot, don't hesitate. Because there's some good stuff here. There's some good kernels and nuggets of wisdom that you could possibly use in your everyday life. And also, I want to state that in this book, some of the graphics that are used are the Ten of Swords and the King of Swords. And if you are anything familiar with the tarot cards, <laughs> well, I love the tongue-in-cheek storyline between the tarot cards. I very much appreciated that, that little element there. So, thank you again for letting me read your book. I really do appreciate it. And I'd like to pick up some more from you if that's all right. I'll see you guys all soon with another video.